Well, good morning and welcome back. We are uh, continuing in John 17. This morning we need to we need to wrap up John 17. But um, I uh, this this area that we're moving into and that we actually got into a little bit last week is something that I have it, it troubles me greatly and it has troubled me probably more than anything else in my adult spiritual life over the years is the fact that we don't seem to be able to get along <laughs> um, and, and we'll talk about that at some length like I said I don't think there's any any spiritual topic that I have thought more about over the years um, some of you have been in small groups that I have sort of vented <laughs> during those experiences. Um, and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna get into all the detail. We, we could go on for weeks. I could talk about this for weeks, but um, I do, it, it gets very personal too as well. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to work our way through this this morning and uh, come out the other side better people, right? Okay. So let's uh, review quickly where we have been so far in this prayer. Um, of course, we're in John chapter 17. This follows the farewell discourse. And now um, in verses, we're just going to quickly review what we've already looked at. Uh, in verses 1 through 5, Jesus begins by making a request for himself. And his request is that he be glorified. And of course, his glorification really is not just to, to put on airs and strut about and look better than anybody else or anything like that. But his, his, point of, his point is he's asking the Father to glorify him by allowing him to complete the mission which his Father has set in front of him. And that will be what brings him glory. But more importantly, that will turn around then and bring God's glory as well. And so Jesus is not self-seeking in this, in this request. He's just praying that he can fulfill the Father's purpose in what he is doing. And then in the next section, in verses 6 through 19, Jesus begins to make specific requests for his disciples and for those who were with him through that evening. He begins by asking, in, or he begins in verses 6 through 10, by telling the Father how devoted these 11 have been. And he, he, he sort of builds them up in the eyes of the Father. And after that, then, in verses 11 through 16, Jesus speaks of their need for spiritual protection. And he asks the Father to protect them, okay, and give them the ability to stay on task. And then he, he takes that and refines it even further as we get to verses 17 through 19. And he talks about their need to be sanctified. Well, sanctified really just means dedicated to that purpose and so that they will be set apart from everybody else in the world and everybody else in all of history in the way that they will fulfill the mission given to them by Jesus. And so Jesus prays now that the Father will help them be sanctified, okay? And that's, that's where we sort of got to last week. Then in the, what, what's left in Jesus' prayer, are verses 20 through 26. And at this point, Jesus expands the scope of his prayer. And he prays not just for the disciples that are present in the room that evening, but he prays for all disciples, okay? And those who, what I'm calling legacy disciples, those who will uh, hear the teaching of the, of the apostles and the disciples and will respond to it in a positive way. And so he prays for them, and that includes us. And what he prays for in verses 20 through 23 is he makes an appeal for unity. And then as he closes out this prayer, he makes an appeal to God that all of these individuals will be able to be brought back together. Okay? And that is, that is where we are heading this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, so we're going to start out, we're going to talk about this section on Jesus praying for unity. And, and as we talked last week... Um, it's easy to look at today's world and see that this prayer has not been met. Uh, and there is all kinds of division, uh, both within what we would term our brotherhood, but also outside of our brotherhood. There's just all kinds of religious and Christian division. 
Um, but we also pointed out last week that that's nothing new, that you can go all the way back to the first century, and most of the, most of the letters of the New Testament were written to address problems and disagreements within churches. And so that's nothing new in the history of, uh, of the church. Um, but what I want us to do right now is to read verses 20 through 23. And as we do, I want for you to recognize that there are some things that are very clear from this text, okay? And we're going to highlight three of them as we finish this up. So let's read uh, verses 20 through 23 as Jesus is now enlarging the scope of his prayer to include all Christians through all of history. Here, here's, what he's, here's what he prayed. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, and may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Okay, observation number one, and these are things that the text is perfectly clear about. Number one is that Jesus is not praying just simply that they get together and be one without being attached in a, in a deeper way. Okay? It's, the point is not just to be a single universal group. What he says is, I want you to be one in us. So there's a, there's a reason that they are to be one and, and, a, and a driving force that can make them one, and that is to be in agreement with Jesus and to be in agreement with his Father. Jesus wants for the, the world's Christians, for those who profess Christ to be in agreement and to be in him. So it's not just sort of a 60s flower child thing where uh, we all need to get together and tolerate whatever, whatever we need to in order to bridge the differences between us. No, Jesus is saying there is a core here that's important and that core is, is being in me, being in my father. That's the thing that will bring unity about according to, according to Jesus. Um, in verse 20, he said, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for them who will believe in me through their message. That is what can be unified underneath. Okay? John has already emphasized this in this book. Back in chapter 10, he talked about there will be one flock under one shepherd. Remember? And then if we go to chapter 15, the beginning of chapter 15, which Jesus had just said a little while ago that evening, um, he said, um, you are the branches and I am the true vine. So they are to be unified, but in Jesus is, is the unif unification principle. That's the standard. That's the, that's the way that they can achieve unity. I read a book years ago and I just, I'm not going to recap the whole book. I just want you to see the title. The title is, was United or Untied. And if you think the word, the, those two words, United and Untied, are anagrams of each other. But you combine them in a different way and you get to those two different words. And what the author was getting at was that there's one path to unity that just says, okay, we'll, we'll untie ourselves to any common belief or anything else. Let's just get along. And that's one way to achieve unity. But that is not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying you need to be one in us. And that is the basis for unity. Our passion has to be honoring and serving God. That has to be our shared passion. And that has to be what we share in common and what draws us together. So point number one that we need to get from this text is that Jesus is not just simply praying that no matter what people, come on everybody, what's that song? Come on everybody, get together now. Love one another for, <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't remember the rest of the song. Come on people now, smile on your brother. You know that one? <laughs> okay, that's not what he's asking for. 
He's asking for a commonness and that we celebrate that by being united. Okay, so that's, that's point number one. Point number two is that we have been given a great treasure, a great privilege, and a great responsibility. Listen to what he said in verse 22. Jesus says, I have given them, that he has given to us, the glory that God gave to him. We have the same mission. That's what he's saying. We have the same responsibility in front of us. That is our responsibility. Um, we bear the image of Christ as we walk with him and as we walk in his way. There is no greater calling for us. And this plea then for unity emphasizes that as we bear Christ's image, we have to bear all of it. And it means we need to look like him, be like him, react like him, love like him. All of those things are part of bearing his image. And the glory that Jesus brought them was shown in the apostles most decidedly during periods of trial and periods of fire and periods of difficulty. And we can see that throughout the rest of the pages of the New Testament. And it needs to be that way for us too. So it's not just when it's easy. It's, it, in fact, it's more significant when it's hard. Okay? So point number two that the text emphasizes as Jesus prays is that we have been given this same privilege and this same responsibility. And we need to get about that business without getting distracted. The third thing that Jesus says is that there will be a result of that uniting. And what will that result be? Complete unity. Okay, the result will, on the first hand will be unification, but what's the effect of that unification? Who does it, who sees it? The world, the world. The world according to the text. Verse 23, um, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So this tells us that the way we treat each other should be seen by the world. If we're doing it right, they're going to see it. That's what, this, that's what this text says. It should be visible, it should be noticeable, and, and, and it should be based, according to this text, on the love of God. And so the world should see our love. And it should overcome some of our differences. What should others see? I've listed four things on my outline here. One thing they should see is they should see self-sacrificing love in God's people. Too often, they don't. They should see 100% commitment to God's mission. The main thing is to be sure that the main thing is the main thing, right? You've heard that before. We have to understand what the main thing is. There are things that are more important. There are things that are less important. Jesus is now talking about the main thing. He's talking about the primary and principal works he has given us to do. And too often we have seen, experienced, and I'm afraid been a part of, too many squabbles and too many little picky situations. Mm -hmm. The word that really gets me, and he says it several times, is even. Even as you have loved me. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty significant also, um, because he could have said, as you love me, but he said even, so it tells me it's even a greater, it's like... Well, it's, it's saying we need to be on that even plane with God's love. When God has shown us his love, that's the even we have to, we're reaching for. Okay? And, of course, that brings up always the Christian dilemma. Will we get there? Probably not. But we're always in the process of refinement, of growth, whatever word you want to use. Right? Jerry? Uh, yeah. You get talking about picking and grumbling. That's what divides congregations, doesn't it? I couldn't hear the last thing you said, Jerry. That's right. divides congregations when people get picky and indifferent on that. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings me to the third thing that I identified. What's the peop what are the people of the world going to see when they see churches oriented towards this? They're going to see cooperation yeah. instead of contention. Mm -hmm. 
They're going to see people giving up sometimes what they personally want for the sake of the leadership, for the sake of the group, for the sake of the unity, for the sake of the reputation of the community. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons for that. But the point is, people are going to cooperate because that's what God calls us to do, period. I want to just go back for a second to your previous point. You said, are we going to get, you know, are we, going to, are, are we there? Everything that God gives us is a growth, right. has growth involved in it, and maturity. And even though we're not there physically, the expectation is in our hearts, we desire to be there. That's right. And that desire is going to now, uh, our actions are going to follow the desire. That's right. If we don't, if, if we never get there, we have to ask ourselves, is it because I tried and I haven't made it yet, or did I give up and didn't even really try? That's right. And I think that's what Jesus said, he's going to divide the sheep and the goat. And, and these, um, these disciples that are present with him in the room, these are perfect models of that principle. They're not perfect. They're not where they're going to be in 40, 50 days from now. They're going to be in a completely different place. But they have, and they have decided that they are going to follow Jesus. And that will take them through whatever else comes. Okay? Craig. that would make up a happy marriage. Well, there's a, there's a lot of similarities, and we're gonna close out by recapturing, we're gonna close this section by recapturing a verse that has been, I think, hijacked to marriage, but it really is talking about churches getting along, but we'll get there in a few minutes, hopefully. <laughs> the fourth thing that I, I, I think the world will see, we, we said they'll see a sac sacrificial love, see 100% commitment to the mission, they'll see cooperation, and they'll see a greater dependence upon God. Yeah. Because that is what will take you to that next step of maturity. No matter what, that is what will take you there, is depending on Him. And depending on Him for, as they've uh, just been prayed about, and they've been, prayed, they've, they've been asked for protection, we need that too. We need spiritual protection too. And we need to depend on God for that. But we need to also be dependent on Him for our sanctification and for our mission and for our purpose and what we are all about. That's right. That's right. Okay. You know, I think sometimes we, we depend on God for what we lack instead of depending on Him for everything. That's right. Because our direction is inside of everything that we do and not just when we, when we fall off course. You know, we don't still, we still aren't guiding our own footsteps is what I'm saying. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that a principle of cheap grace. The grace applies when I can't take care of something myself. And he said, no, that's not grace. Grace is that which rescues you wholly and completely and places you on a new level, period. Not because you're sh of your shortcomings, but because right. of your nature, who we are, and how much we need God. Jim. I think one of us has achieved that yet, and I certainly don't stand before you as that person. You know, but have we quit striving? I hope not. I haven't. I hope you haven't either. Okay. And then the other thing that I was thinking about this week was, you know, of course we know that the first man was to love God with everything that we are, and then to love each other like that. For those of you that might not have been able to hear, Jamie just simply said the, the acronym, what would Jesus do? 
is very helpful for us to understand about the directions we need to take when we're facing those moments, uh, whether they're big or little in our, in our decision making. Uh, Jerry, let's, we gotta go quickly because I've got a lot to go over here. Well, perfect means mature. So perfect is a mature unity. But yes, it's a, it is a complete unity as well. Um, and, and so there is, there is we, have, we have to figure out how to bridge that gap. But I would suggest to you that it's not all them. We too have taken positions that are divisive. Okay? Okay, here's, here's where, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna get a little bit personal here and reflect on some things that mean something to me. I don't know why Jesus made this request of his father, and there's a lot about it that puzzles me. How could Jesus, being God himself, pray to his father God for something that they both want, and it hasn't happened? Stew on that for a while. And the only way I've been able to reconcile that is perhaps it's because we have been unwilling to follow. Amen. Not just individually, but us, meaning us historically, all those people that he was talking about here, including the guys in the room that night. Okay? Not a one of them was perfect. Um, but nonetheless, in spite of the fact that I can't understand all of the ramifications of this request. It's important enough to Jesus that he prays for it as he's literally on his way to be arrested. That tells us that this is something that's significant to him. So, from 30,000 feet, what is the problem? Why can't we? Well, some would say, and this is what was just pointed out a minute ago, that we can't seem to get together on doctrinal ideas. And there's truth to that. But I would also say that I know some very well-meaning, spiritually-minded people who see some things differently than I do. And they're looking at the same texts and the same scriptures I am. I don't know why I see it differently than they do. They seem to be honest, they seem to have integrity, and they see it differently. Even within our own brotherhood, tribe, movement, whatever terminology you want to use, even within that group, we are unable to achieve complete doctrinal consensus. We keep dividing amongst ourselves. In fact, if I'm honest, I can't even achieve that unity in myself. Sometimes I sort of think one thing, sometimes I think another. You know, I waffle a little bit. but. But the restoration movement has been plagued by division throughout its history. That's not always the case. Craig pointed that out last week. There are, there are other things that, that enter into it. But if you look at our movement as a whole, and particularly if you look at it from an outsider, you're going to see all kinds of problems. So go ahead, Lamar. Well, if you start with the core of who Jesus was, what he did, what it means to us from a standpoint of redemption and then work out from there, I think you'll find the majority of the issues are out here, but not in the central core. We'll get there. Okay. Yep. Yep. But even with those differences, I think the most damning piece of evidence is that many times division occurs over things that are clearly not doctrinal. They simply occur over items of preference, yep. of items that are superficial and unimportant, but nonetheless, they lead to division. Um, so I think the lack of doctrinal agreement, yes, it's a problem, but it's not the only problem, because it doesn't explain, that doesn't explain everything. There's also an inadequate tolerance and a failure to practice the type of love that Jesus is talking about right here. Um, getting along is not the same thing as being unified. Coexisting is not the same thing as cooperating. 
Let me say that again. Getting along is not the same thing as being unified. Coexisting is not the same thing as cooperating. And Jesus calls us to the higher standard. He calls us to be unified. He calls us to cooperate. And therefore, I would say that both of these items are on trial here. <laughs> the item of are we going to agree doctrinally or can we agree doctrinally? And secondly, are we going to make a decision to tolerate one another and tolerate those things particularly that are not part of that core, right? Now, those of you that have been subjected to my take on this in uh, small groups know that this is a text I go back to over and over and over again whenever we're talking about this. And that's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read this, and as I read it, I want you to listen to those two sides of the coin. Listen how Jesus is talking about a, what I'm going to call a core content, the core doctrines, but also he describes a core character, the type of people we need to be in honoring one another. And listen as, Pete, as, as, yeah, as Paul describes that type of getting along. This, in my opinion, is one of the most important unity passages in all of Scripture. G uh, Paul writes, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Okay, that's just what we said a minute ago. We have been given a special treasure. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, this is not going to be easy, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through a bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And there you have it. On the left side of this chart, you'll see those character attributes that Paul's talking about. And those are those attributes that will allow us to get along together and honor one another and respect one another in spite of our differences. Paul says it's not going to be easy. You can only achieve unity by making an effort. It's not going to happen naturally. It's it, it, not, not what they are expecting of us, not what they are looking at. It's hard. And, and those character attributes are humility, placing a value on other people and what they think, gentleness, controlling my temperament, patience, my willingness to wait, bearing with one another in love, bearing with one another, Enduring for the sake of other people, bearing with them, working with them. That's an intentional decision to put up with other people. And the word again that comes up is that of cooperating. I will cooperate in this scenario, in this situation, because of my love for Christ. And then if we move beyond the character attributes over the right-hand side of the chart, you see the core content. And here Paul defines what that central core has to be. And this is where we find the unity in Christ and in his Father that Jesus has just prayed about. It's on these issues. There is one body. There is one group of believers. Whether you agree with that or not, there is one group of believers. I don't know that the lines exactly tie up with what we see the lines as being, but there is one body. Don't make that mistake. There is one body. We may not recognize that one body, but there is one body. There is one spirit who lives in every single one of those believers, and it's the same spirit. Um, there is one hope. Because we all share that hope for our personal redemption and for our security and for, for our futures to be uh, eternal with God. There is one Lord. That Lord has to be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. 
There cannot be any other human Lord. There cannot be any other authority that we, we respect and honor with every facet of our lives. Jesus is our Lord. There is one faith, and that faith is the faith that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be, that he was indeed God's son. And it's just that simple, and it's just that profound at the same time. There is one baptism, and this is where we might start moving into some conflict with other believers, but the text is clear. There is one baptism, and that baptism is a fresh start. Uh, as, as we talked about in John chapter 3, it's a rebirth from above. That is the baptism that's being described here. And there is one God and Father of all, who is over all in all and through all. He is transcendent. He overrules everything and he is present in everything. Those are the core beliefs of a united church. You would think the word one, the way Paul lays it out, would dispel anything beyond one. You know, how do you argue with this? You can't. You can't. You cannot. And I think God did this intentionally Watch the argument at the core, because if we come out of the core with one, how do we get many out here? That's right. You can't. That's right. Unless, of course, we start our pride, egos, right. personalities, and all of those things enter in and now become more important than the core. So meditate on this passage. Go back and read it this coming week, and look at that character, and look at those concepts. And just evaluate yourself on that scale. Am I willing to put up with others as is described over here? But am I also willing to stand where we must stand? Because that is the basis of unity. If we go down in the chapter a little farther, we get finally to verses 15 and 16. And Paul uses a very simple phrase to describe, to summarize, I think, what he's talking about here. In verse 15, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love. That's what he's talking about. That's what that chart is all about. It's about speaking the truth in love. That's what it's all about. As we, as we um, speak the truth in love, we will, in all things, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. That brings about unity. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's a picture of a unified body. Not that everybody's doing exactly the same task. No, that's not what's being described here. But what's being described here is the common mission, the common character, the common portrayal, the common message that is inherent within our existence together. It's also a mature body. Absolutely. It's a mature body. Craig? You also have to be prepared for what the world is going to say or how the world is going to respond. Absolutely. It's guaranteed they're going to call you a hater. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we need to soften it. We need to learn how to soften it. He said here, speak the truth in, the, in a loving way. So we need to seek that. You can't hit people over the head with the truth. That's not what he's talking about. He says, speak the truth in love. Many times I think we have brought that condemnation on ourselves, not by what we've said, but how we have said it. We are all indicted here. I'm not, <laughs> we're all, we're all guilty, right? Okay. So that's Paul's um, summary. My resolutions, and this gets even more personal. <laughs> I told you already, I'm not quite sure how to deal with all this because it seems like in so many ways the cat's just out of the bag. And, and what can little old me accomplish in this regard? Well, I'm gonna focus on three things having looked at this a lot. Number one, 
I want to focus on being united with Christ and aligned with his cause and his mission. I want to remember that our enemy is not ourselves. Our enemy is the world. And that does not necessarily mean every doctrine that disagrees with the way I see it. The enemy is the world. Remember that. Does the world ever see Christians in a favorable light? It's easy to I see a couple of heads going this way and I see a couple of heads going this way. But the answer to that is yes. When we are doing what our primary task is, when we are serving other people, when we're demonstrating love, when we're doing good things for our neighbors, the world sees that and recognizes that as something that we would do only because we are in Jesus Christ. And that is a powerful, powerful message. And that is what we have to focus on. I don't, I don't think, as, as I look at this and I say, what can I do? I can't fix the world. <laughs> I can't fix the country. I can't fix the city. But what I can do is I can support and participate in showing Christ's love to my neighbor. And in fact, I'm responsible to do that. Go ahead, Lamar. They can't see it from the label of Christian. That's right. They see it from the action. Very good. Yeah, I was going to say it in this way. I was going to say they'll never see it when they're looking at institutions, but they'll see it in individual actions and, and cooperative actions. If they see a church working together to do something in the neighborhood, like a, a um, what's the name of our uh, outreach? Yeah, if they, if they see something like that, that makes, that's obvious. And it's obvious why it's being done. Okay? And, and maybe, maybe that's not the right ministry for us going forward, but there's got to be something that we can do where we cooperatively look at serving others around us. Let's take the, the situation in Ukraine. You have all these people that say, I love my country. That's one thing. But now they have picked up arms and they're following that word with action by fighting against an enemy that's greater, better equipped, and actually probably more than likely are going to defeat them, but that doesn't stop them from the action. Taking the action. And that's what Christ is looking for in us. Christ calls us to take the action. You're right. Step up to the plate and do it. <laughs> Secondly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray about it. I have not prayed a lot for unity in my adult Christian life, and especially when I think about the unity within, within Christendom. But I'm going to change that. This was important enough for Jesus to pray about it. It needs to be important enough for me to pray about it. And I'm going to. Um, if nothing else, praying about it will serve to remind me that it's important in God's eyes. And it'll put it on my conscience. And it will remind me of the importance of that core character and those core concepts. I need to be praying about this. Pray quickly. You just said something. You asked earlier about why did Jesus pray to God when he wanted the same thing. And you just said, you would pray even if just to remind myself. So maybe Jesus was reminding himself. Yeah, he's facing multiple challenges of being human here, right? Yeah. Third thing is I have to stretch my own personal comfort zone. I have to understand that not everything was on that list on the right-hand side there. There are some things that are ones, and there are some things that I need to just put up with, even though I may not see it exactly that way. Um, the only way that I can ever demonstrate my love for Christ is to show my willingness to cooperate and associate with others. That's the only way I can show it. So, as we conclude this section on unity, I want to take this text I was talking about a few minutes ago, a text that we usually reserve for the wedding ceremony. But it wasn't written for a wedding ceremony. It was written to a church in Corinth that couldn't get along. 
And Paul wrote these words in, in chapter 13. I encourage you, just close your eyes and think about this, not in the context of, of loving in a spousal way or in a, um, in a marital commitment for a change. Listen to these words as they were intended, because they were intended to talk about people in a congregation who needed to learn to get along. And this is what Paul said. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. And it is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Does that describe me? Does that describe us? We can and must do better. We can and must do better. All right, just quickly, I want us to run through the rest of Jesus' prayer here then. We get to the last three verses of this amazing revelation. And this is where Jesus now prays for a future reunion. He expresses this as his ultimate desire, which was behind the reason he came to earth in the first place. Um, and again, this is a time now to put ourselves in the shoes of those who were listening. As they heard Jesus pray this for their behalf, and as he prays it for our behalf, because we are still the people, that's his target audience, is still us. Here's what he says, verses 24 through 26. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Verse 24, Jesus says he wants his own to share in his glory. Not what he's experiencing on earth, but now he's talking about his heavenly glory, his heavenly splendor. This is the same promise he gave him back in chapter 14 when he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe God, you believe me also. I'm going to prepare a place so that we can be together. And that's what he's praying for now is, God, Father, bring this to completion. Bring this about. I want to be with them. He doesn't give any specifics of when this will happen, of where it will happen, but he just prays for this certainty that, they, that it will take place and that they will be together. Okay? Verse 25. Jesus says, my mission has always been to show my Father to them. That's what his mission has been all along. And he contrasts how the world doesn't know God with how much he knows God and knows God intimately. And reala the reality is, is that without Jesus, we would be just as ignorant as the Jews of the first century. We've talked about how they've gotten so focused on law and legalism we would be, and, and we tend to be in the same place anyhow. If you want to lose your legalism, look at Jesus. If you want to lose your legalism, look at Jesus. And watch how he treats people. What a blessing it is for us to see God in the flesh. And in action. When I think about that, I feel totally humiliated on one hand. Because even at my best, I can't begin to measure up to what he has done and who he is. But on the other hand, because I've seen his life, I can feel completely secure, I can feel completely loved, 
and it allows me then to reach out and give value to other people. If I just look at Jesus. A few weeks ago, I was talking with Luann. Many of you know how strong her faith is. And Lu Luann was talking about some things she has learned and observed working her way through this, this book. And she said, you know what? I'm not as afraid to die anymore. And, you know, I don't know if it gets any more personal than that, does it? But that is the faith. That is the faith we ought to have when we see Jesus and we see what he, what he does, what he promises, who he is, how he portrays his father. There's, there's no reason for fear. And, and, for, and, and that is the intent of what God, why John wrote this book, why God had John write this book. That's the intention is so that we might believe. And believing is not just an intellectual thing. It's putting our trust in it, you know? And that's, that was... Uh, I think that's what this gospel is all about. When you boil it all down, it's about seeing God. And then in verse 26, Jesus wants us to know his Father too. And that's the reason that he revealed God. He has shown us God's character. He has shown us God's love. And now we are to be that same character and that same mind. And with those words... Jesus concludes his prayer to his Father. He has expressed all the ideas that he talked about with these guys throughout the evening. He has appealed to his Father that he be glorified, that his disciples be protected, that his apostles be fully devoted to the purpose for which they've been called that all of us find a basis for unity and that in the end we will all be reunited in a grand and glorious time in a grand and glorious place. But as we leave chapter 17, it's clear we're headed towards the cross. That's the only, that's the only thing left in, in, in Jesus' doing. We are going to see a major shift in the text. The text now will not consist of lengthy discussions, teaching, preaching. It will just simply record the actions, the things that happen. The events will tell the story. They don't need to be explained. They don't need to be commentaried on. And I would just say that for us, uh, reaching this point in the book, through these first 17 chapters, we've been exposed, I think, to the mind of Christ. We have seen it inside and out. But now what we're going to see is we're going to see what that mind looks like in action as it walks through these next few hours. And what a blessing I, I think that's going to be for all of us. So, God bless us to that end. God is good. Amen.